Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. I'm your host, Priest, joined by my co-host, my brother, the one and only Phoenix. Say what's up to the camera. What's up, y'all? This is called the Burn Factory for a reason. I was literally caught on fire. 50% chance to survive, but through that, started this podcast because I believe Every single person out there on this planet goes through a burn moment somewhere in their life. You heard Priest say a burn moment. So a burn moment is a super hard time in your life that you just have to fight and to overcome to ultimately get you where you are today. And me and Priest believe that every single person on this earth go through burn moments that truly make them who they are. But Priest, what an amazing guest we have today. I am super excited for this episode. If you were an entrepreneur out here, you would definitely want to hear this. He's the president of of Cookie Co. And man, do I tell you, these are some of the best cookies I've ever had. Blows crumble out of the way. So please give a warm <laughs> welcome to Matt Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for that intro. What an <laughs> intro. Appreciate it. So I just recently saw that Cookie Company just turned three. Congrats on yeah. that. Yeah, bro. It was wild. Yesterday was our three year anniversary. Wow. It's weird to think it's been three years. It feels a lot of times like, I'm like how long have we been doing this? Seven, eight months? I'm like, no, 2020. What? How that? It's wild. Time goes by really quickly. So it's, it's a trip for sure. Did you ever think you would uh, be this far three, three years later? To be honest, no. Um, when we started, the goal was to survive the pandemic, right? And we started, my wife, it was her idea. We started in our garage in 2019, early, late 2019. Plan was to be open, to be open in April of 2020. And then pandemic hit in January in Southern California. And at that point, it was like, I closed my other business, not by choice, but we had to. Um, lost all of our contracts there and uh, kind of pivoted into this. I'm like, hey, let's get this open. Let's get the doors open. Let's have some income, right? And then the pandemic hit and it really affected us negatively. Um, and the goal was to survive the pandemic with a single location. I think we have 25 open locations right now with another 12 to 15 scheduled this year, which is wild. Wow. You actually did open your first store back in August of 2020. What was that like during COVID with all the regulations? and? Yeah, so one day uh, I'm going to give a TED Talk, and the topic is going to okay. be how to start a business during a global pandemic with a pregnant wife <laughs> and your house is on fire. Yeah, Because that's really what happened, right? Mm -hmm. And starting a business in any capacity, you know, whatever it is, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's a brick and mortar, whether it's a service-based industry, um, there's a lot of things to learn. There's a lot of risk, there's money, there's so many, there's so many moving parts, right? Um, starting it during the pandemic was, um, I, you call it a burn moment, I call them burn the ships moments, where you've gotta to commit to go all in, right? And that's kinda of what we did, and it wasn't by choice. It was like, hey, we literally had a conversation, my wife and I, um, about a month before we opened our doors. We're like, hey, let's get the doors open, let's open, let's work our butts off. We got two choices, we work our butts off and we succeed, or we work our butts off and we f go bankrupt and start over. But the point is, you go all in, right? And so we did, and um, we were just, were, our community was fantastic, we had so much support, and it grew pretty quickly. We had people from all over the country, like, hey, we heard about Cookie Co on social media, hey, we wanna open one in our community, hey, we, like, places I never heard of, you know? So, it was wild, you know? Were you still running your other business during this time? So I had stepped back pretty significantly. Uh, I was a CBO there, so chief brand officer. Um, and a lot of my contracts were with some major companies. Um, and they had, a, a, as many companies do, their attorneys put certain things in. Uh, act of God clause. Hey, if something happens, we can pull back. And it was, hey, two weeks to slow the curve. Let's pull back for a couple weeks. And we know how that <laughs> that out. ended out. So we had, um, over the course of about three months, we lost as a small company, we lost about $9 million in, in, in contracts. Oh. And that was like 80, 90% of this year's revenue. And we're like, all right, forecasted revenue, right? And so we're like, we may not make it, so take us off payroll. Let's keep the development, keep the tech alive, keep the website going, keep the people on staff and not pay ourselves for two months. It was a plan. And then uh, it got to like May and I'm like, hey, just take me off payroll completely in, or sorry, March, take me off payroll completely. I'll be a consultant. I'll keep my network and keep working on that. And then by May, I'm like, Hey guys, I'm doing this with my wife. As you guys know, this is my all in. I'm going in on this. I think we can make a move with this. I'll still consult, still be involved. And then by like June, everyone kind of like, we don't know what's going on. It kind of just, 
fizzled out and mm -hmm. we basically just folded the company. How hard was it for you to go all in on this? You know, I, for, I think you got two kinds of people who go all in, people who make calculated decisions and then you got risk takers. I'm more of a risk taker. Um, I'm not the most educated person in the room and that's why I'm okay as you even said, hey president, I was a CEO and I wore that hat uncomfortably because I'm not a CEO type of a person. I could not wait for the moment that I could hire somebody better than me and we've since brought on a new CEO who was my advisor for about nine months, who's now our CEO and so um, it was for me, like I said, I, I'm, I'll go all in with a low pocket pair, you know, because mm -hmm. I think I just play it right. And so I, 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 I constantly take risks and I think when you take risks and you have a good network and you're not afraid to lose, but more importantly, you refuse to quit. That's one thing that I've learned. One of my favorite quotes is in business, but I think in life in general, um, people don't fail, they give up. And businesses don't fail, they give up. I think you can only fail once you quit. Once you throw in the flag, it's over. If you are still going and you haven't given up, there's always a chance. I mean, you said 50% chance to recover. You know, I, I've got an aunt who was sick and she felt ill, uncomfortable. She goes to the doctor and the doctor's like, hey, you've got cancer through your, your entire body. You've got about six weeks to live. Oh. She died like eight weeks later. And I'm like, how'd she not known that? Because I mean, you don't just get cancer in your whole body over the course of a week. Like, she knew this for, she, she didn't know, but this was for years. Yeah. And I think there's a switch in our minds that when we hear what their chances are of success or chances of failure or whatever are, I think some of us make a choice to like, I'm going to beat this or others, unfortunately, like, all right, sounds like it's over. Mm -hmm. And they kind of cater to, that mindset, you know? You, you gotta have a good mindset, man. You can never focus on the bad. You always gotta focus on the good because if you do focus on the good, the good will come out of it. Mm -hmm. Whenever I was in the hospital, I wasn't thinking about losing my life. I was trying to get out of the hospital and go do what I wanted to do and golf. And it's all in the mindset, baby. 100%. Mindset is everything, man. And uh, I've learned that through business, you know, business connections I've made. Uh, you know, I have a lot of mutual friends who are UFC fighters and champions and you know, just badasses, right? Yeah. And you'd have conversations with these people, whether it's they're a fighter, they're a business owner, an entrepreneur, a pro surfer, a pro skater, whatever. A lot of these people, it's like, yeah, I just, I go for it. I don't give up. I don't know what that's like. You know, I had a, I had a, I had a previous business associate who wanted to give up on their business. And I'm like, hey, don't, don't give up yet. Have you reserved, you know, have you used all your resources? Have you, and, and she, I remember she asked me, she said, why do you care if I give up? Why not just let me quit? And I'm like, because the thought of that, like makes, would keep me up at night. Like I, mm -hmm. I can honestly say that I've never actively quit something before. Like I've had opportunities and things that, you know, my last company wasn't by choice. I went all in to the point where I wasn't being paid for months on end, not knowing what the future was like, I'm not saying never pivot, but you know, res go through all your resources, right? Before you just give up. Mm -hmm. I, that feeling scares me. Yeah. Straight up. It is scary because I feel like once you start something, you like have to finish on it. And uh, if you don't, I'm like you, I don't think I could sleep at night if I didn't give it my all. No. I mean, I, I get anxiety when I hear about people quitting, right? Like not jobs, but like shutting down their business or giving up on their dream or whatever, you know? Uh, I don't remember who it was, but I saw might've been Dana White or somebody who was doing a reel or might've been Joey Diaz. I'm pretty sure it was Joey Diaz. <laughs> Joey uh, Diaz. He was on Joe Rogan podcast mm -hmm. and it was just a clip. And he talked about like, you know, go to like a, a grocery store or a hotel and see somebody working as a janitor. Right. And say, like, their plan was never to do that. There's nothing wrong with it. He said, which I agree. There's nothing wrong with that. But like, was that their plan? Was that what they wanted to do? Was that their dream? No, they like gave up on their dream because it got hard. It got difficult. Circumstances changed. Right. And I think we're all in different places, different points in our life. We can make different sacrifices. But at the end of the day, like you said, mindset is everything. Like once you have your mind made up just and you're passionate about it and you want it, you go after it and you commit. Like that's the deal yeah. is just commit. Mm -hmm. You got to commit in everything in life. But all right, Matt. So on this show, we do use the acronym BURN. So each letter is a different time in your life. So starting with B, B is beginning. So take us back to the beginning. Take us to your childhood. Was there any burn moments that uh, you had to fight to overcome um, that you could share with us? Yeah. So I like that acronym. I like the burn, et cetera, beginning, et cetera. That's cool. Um, 
Yeah, so my childhood was, you know, I think I had a good childhood, you know, grew up in the 90s, which I think the 90s were the best generation, bro. We hey, man, I wish I grew up <laughs> in the 90s. Come there's, on. There's a reason I'm just making a comeback, right? The music was dope. Yes. I mean, things were just, things were rad. You know, I got four kids, right? And like back in the 90s, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't, my parents just knew I was riding from one friend's house to the other house on who knows what side of town. And I came home when the lights went off, you know, when the street lights went off, right? Or when they, when they came on, I should say. So um, beginning, I grew up in Northern California, and my dad was a sergeant. Uh, he worked at Folsom Prison for a number of years, and he, he transferred, and I grew up in basically Redding, California. So that's where my family's from, born and raised. Um, went to a lot of schools there, back to the burn moment there. I think the biggest burn moment childhood-wise was probably, um, I was actually telling my wife about this, from kindergarten to my senior year of high school, I went to 11 schools. Oh. And I think that was a burn moment for me in some ways because I had to learn how to make friends. I had to learn how to be the new kid and regularly how to make conversations, how to communicate, how to do these things at a young age where I didn't realize that they'd probably benefit me later in life. You know, like I'm, I'm very comfortable walking up to somebody and be like, hey, dude, I I'm, love what you're doing. I think it's really cool. Tell me about how, how'd you start this, right? And then connections, that's how I know a lot of the guys that you and I know, right? Mm -hmm. So I just, hey, you know so-and-so, you're friends with my homie. Oh, yeah, he's great. What's your name? Cool, what do you do? Oh, do it. I follow you guys on Instagram, whatever, right? Um, but yeah, I think that's, for me, going back to the beginning, that's, that's kind of one of the biggest burn moments is, is being the new kid all the time kind of forced me to adapt and have different social skills, I think you could say. It wasn't easy, and at the time it felt like, dude, are my parents in witness protection program? We're being chased by the mafia. Why are we moving so much, <laughs> yeah. right? And, uh, and, and so now that I'm older, I look at it, I'm like, it wasn't a negative thing. I think it provided a lot of benefits to me, you know? Why were you guys moving so much? So my dad, long story short, and I don't know how much I should get into. He'd probably be like, it's private. But um, <laughs> so my dad, back in the early 90s, um, he actually started working with a couple of his friends when he worked for the state of California. Um, they actually were going to Russia when the economy collapsed in Russia and the ruble was like a billion ruples for like a loaf of bread, my dad was going over there and buying night optic goggles and scopes and things like that for like 18 bucks. Hmm. And he was coming back with his friends and they were selling them and they had contracts with the state, they had contracts with police departments, military, et cetera, and they were doing this. Um, and um, then the state was like, hey, you can't do this anymore. And they shut him down. And then after that, he kind of moved around quite a bit. Um, and then he retired from the state of California and then had a few different job opportunities he was chasing. Um, he was always, he was a hustler, you know, he was always grinding. He was an entrepreneur. My dad's story is crazy. I mean, if you guys ever want to have a random person on the podcast, talk to my dad about his burn moments, dude. Let's like, get him on. Yeah, we'll have to get him on. Straight up. I mean, I, I could share some of it, but it's, it's wild. I, I keep telling you, you need to write a book because it's unbelievable. Like, it's, I'm like, he moved out. He got an apartment when he was 13 years old. Oh. Right, his dad died when he was four. Mom became an alcoholic afterwards. Married some guy, abandoned him. He lived in a trailer with his grandma. My uncle was—I can't say what he was associated with on camera because they don't like that. But he rode with like a motorcycle gang, and mm -hmm. he was like the sergeant of arms. Did dealt drugs for him and weapons and things like that. And he basically raised my dad. Right, so you can imagine like what my dad kind of grew up around. Yeah. So he had just had a wild life, you know. And so I think my dad. Like all parents, they do the best job that they know how. And being my dad's situation, I think he did a decent job raising a heathen like myself, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of the beginning for me is growing up in Redding, California, growing up. And I, I lived there until I was about 20, went and wrestled at a Juco up there for a couple of years, Shasta College. And the plan was to go to Fresno. And then Title IX kicked in in 05, they canceled the program. Uh, I was actually just talking to Uriah Faber about this at Power Slap Championships mm -hmm. we were at. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was coaching at UC Davis at the time that I was transferring to Fresno. And so they lost a program. We lost a program. Like all of Northern California schools like lost a program right around the same time. So after that, that was, I mean, that was, that was, that was the end of my childhood, really. really. Yeah. I what mean, made you get into wrestling? Um, so when I was really young, my dad, like I said, he was always hustling. He was an entrepreneur. He owned a gym. And uh, throwback to UFC turning 30, Ken Shamrock and my dad were good friends. And Ken Shamrock and his brother Frank used to work out at our gym. And so when I was about three years old, my dad, it would, he'd, he'd start to say, hey, let's get you into wrestling next year. So I remember being like four years old going my first practice. My dad wow. wrestled in college as well before he went to the military. So I started wrestling when I was about six. Um, wrestled from the time I was six until 
seventh grade, I took a year off because we moved middle of the school year and then started up again in eighth grade, then through high school and then through college and pretty much wrestled year round through high school, you know? So I just kind of learned and got into it really young. And some of the people my dad was connected with, I'm like, Ken Shamrock, Greg Gibson, <laughs> you know, Olympic champions. I'm like, those guys are studs. I want to be like that at six years old, you know? Yeah. So, Do you ever want to get into the UFC eventually or no? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say that I think I could have done it. Would I have liked to have done it? Like any kid who wants to be a pro ba basketball player, love the idea of it. Do I think I would have been super successful? I don't know. I, had I committed, who knows? Um, I had a few amateur fights. I had four. Oh. Um, in a small, it was called ECW. Um, and it was West Coast. Like there was a couple in Vegas, one in Vegas that I fought in, one in Reno, one in Salt Lake City. And then I think the other one was in Billings, Montana. And so I had four fights. I won all four of those. By, there you go. A TKO knockout. One was submission, but the other oh, were, nice. were early stoppage. Um, <clears throat> and then my wife and I were like, well, let's get married. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I got to get a job that pays me more than, <laughs> more than 150 bucks in a hotel. You know what I mean? So yeah. that was it. And then I just I started doing door-to-door -door sales. I did door-to-door -door sales for years through college. That's how I really got into being an entrepreneur, just knocking doors. You always yeah. had that go get a mentality. I had to, man. Like I said, I think I think a lot of it had to do with just growing up the way I did and like learning, like seeing like successes, seeing struggles. But at the end of the day, like the, the successes came after the struggle. And I saw my dad succeed and thrive, and I saw him struggle through times. And those things were just ingrained in me. You know, mm -hmm. I learned at a, I learned at an early age that you know nobody was going to do it for me. I was on my own. Like nobody's coming to save me. You know, like kill what you eat mentality, right? Or eat what you kill mentality. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just kind of started doing that and hustled, and I think it's led me through some interesting times of growth and opportunity and just hustle, you know? That's the mentality you have to have, though. To build something great, you just got to be knocking down doors, knocking down doors, knocking down doors. And for us, that's what we've really tried to do, only being six months old with, with our business and our brand that we're trying to build. You guys are just killing it. Knock doors, knock Thank doors. Thank you. appreciate it. You guys and, are uh, killing it. I love it. My dad always has a, uh, has a quote. It's some will, some won't, so what, who's next? Love that. And I feel like that's the mentality that you have to have as an entrepreneur because it's hard. Oh, yeah. It so is very stuck. hard and you have to take risks. You have to be able to put everything you have into your belief and into your mission. If you don't, then it won't be successful. Well, to your dad's quote, you know, I was just talking to my CEO the other day and we we're saying, like, hey, like, we got some things we got to work out. We're always transitioning and with a new CEO, this transitions and some new hires and some budgets and forecasts and difficulties. And, you know, you got attorneys for a reason. Things happen, right? Like trademark things we're fixing. And there's days that suck. There's days that are headaches, right? And I think at the end of the day, I was telling her, I said, you know, the thing that, one of the things that drives me as a business owner is I, I know a lot of business owners. I know a lot of successful business owners, right? And I read a lot of books, listen to a lot of podcasts. I've been on a few podcasts with other hosts who are successful at you guys or, or starting podcasts. Um, and I've never met or heard of a business owner who's successful today who it was easy for, right? Like it just doesn't exist. If, there, if, if it was easy... There would, be, there would be no books by entrepreneurs because nobody wants to hear about how easy your life was to become an entrepreneur. They want to hear like, hey, what was your burn moment? How mm -hmm. did you start? Why did you start? Why did you continue? How did you continue? That sounds like hell on earth, like, but you did it. And look at you now, you've got a multi-million dollar company, right? Like Dana White, right? What did he do? How did he start? Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so many guys who are successful today who, where did they start? You know, and they made a decision. And, you know, I have a, an acronym that I have to use. Um, called DAP, it's just DAP. It's decide, DAP. act, and persevere, right? So you start with decision, like you take action, you continue to persevere after you start that first step, like bracing for the storm, bracing for impact, uh -huh. continuing, just persevering, you know? But during the tough times too, embrace it all because you, you learn the to. most out of it. Have to, you know, enjoy the journey, right? Versus focusing on the destination. I mean, I, I jokes aside, like I have a master's degree in freaking franchise and business hypothetically that there is no master's degree for this, but in three years of doing this to the point we have now where we have the payroll we have, the employees we have, all these things, learned a ton, yeah. you know? So enjoying the journey, enjoying those moments, taking the burn moments when they come and, you know, remembering them and building strength from those, like those, it all adds up. For yeah. sure. The what school of hard knocks. That's what my dad always says. <laughs> for sure. You're living through the school of hard knocks. For sure. You can learn way more doing that than just 
being in, in school and in, in a classroom. Bro, I went to college. I got a degree in business and marketing. And within a year after I graduated and trying to find a job, half the stuff that I was taught was outdated. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't do case studies on influencer management or social media for marketing. Like we were reading like PR reports from the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Alaska in 1989. What? How this Bro, like that was the stuff they taught you. And it was, it was what they knew, right? And so it's like, I think a lot of education is probably 10 to 12 years too old when it's being taught. Because I like, look at AI. Well, I mean, what professor can, what, there's not a professor out there who's over 45 years old who can even explain what AI is or even be how to teach you to get an undergrad and how you're going to compete with AI. Newsflash, you're not, mm-hmm. right? Like you might be able to utilize AI, but they're not even teaching that yet. So you get a degree, congratulations, you graduate in June with a degree. All right, well, AI is really the next move. I, I got to deep dive into this and figure out how this is going to affect my job, the future, my employment opportunities, right? I mean, yeah. there's a lot going on. AI is getting scary, man. Bro, I don't, I, listen, I, I find it interesting that if you look back on Elon Musk, for years he was saying that AI would destroy humanity, and now he's embracing it. And I'm like, maybe Elon Musk is AI, and this was all reverse psychology. Oh, um, huh. I still I like it. About that. I just remember he, him and Joe Rogan used to talk about it, and yeah. now he's all about like, the neural link and the brain, AI, AI, AI. And I'm like, dude, five, six years ago, you didn't like AI, and now something changed. It, something changed. What was that burn moment that changed for him? I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to find out. <laughs> we'll have to have find out. We'll <laughs> talk about it for sure. Wow, Matt, that was a crazy beginning in your life. I can't even imagine transferring schools eleven times growing up, and yeah, it's. I couldn't even imagine. I'm I'm sitting here thinking about it. And like I, I went to school and now I'm homeschooled, but transferring eleven times, it's brutal. But it's time to go to you and burn. Unfortunate, I believe through those unfortunate times, the best things more than likely come out of them. You gotta put your you gotta have a good mentality to them. But I kind of want to explain to you what happened with me. Yeah. It was the last week of school. I was in sixth grade. Teacher was doing a science experiment that involved fire. It's called the fire black snake. Have you heard of it? Yeah. It's supposed to form this charcoal snake with like sand, rubbing alcohol, yeah. baking soda. So she takes us outside and she's like, all right, everyone's sitting in like a horse shaped U circle, good couple feet away from like here to the camera right there. Yeah. And it wasn't working. And she had rubbing alcohol to her side because she thought like if she dumped a little bit and it can kind of work and start to form, but it's not. She grabs the rubbing alcohol, dumps it into the flame, and it bursts like a bomb. And I was immediately rushed to ICU. That's the last thing I remember. Last thing I remember. And then I remember kind of, it's so weird because in a traumatic experience, you don't really remember what's going on in the moment. You just kind of remember pieces of it. Sure. So I just remember getting into the hospital bed and thinking it was a dream. I swear, I was like, am I living in a dream? And I literally had to pinch myself because I was like, Oh my God, no, this is real. And But through those tough times, good can come out of it. And I remember waking up, having my dad go get my putter, and I would put golf balls into a glass jar as I'm all hooked up to everything, came and see because my whole face is swelled up. And I would constantly be putting golf balls into a glass jar. And I could either worry about losing my life or I can think about the good and the positive that brings me joy in that tough time. And that's when I was like, that's my burn moment. I'm not going to worry about losing my life. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm going to worry about right now and get out of this hospital. And I won the fight. Dude, that's deep. That's deep. I mean, that, a lot of decisions in that moment, right? I get, the thing I think about when you're being, I've never been in a hospital bed like that, right? Never been in one of those moments. But I think, like, the thoughts that you have, the demons you're facing in that time, like, your mind can be your biggest advocate, your biggest enemy, right? Plays tricks on you, right? Especially in those moments of, like, mo- desperate moments, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's wild. Uh, because you've told me your story before, you know, not to that extent, but I'm always like, man, like, what was going through your head, mm-hmm. right? 
it's it's hard because like for sure. he was like 12 years old man for sure and then you're thinking like man as bad as it sounds there's so many bad people in this world like why him he's so young sure. he's so pure he's my little freaking brother man like how could this happen to him but in the long run those unfortunate burn moments really build you to who you are and and show you that if i can overcome this i can overcome anything whether it's business whether it's sports for sure. you can overcome it and i think burn moments are such a crucial thing to people's lives and they really need to understand it so for you being an entrepreneur building a business from the ground up in one of the hardest times in this country um, were there some unfortunate burn moments that you had to fight to overcome dude so you do b-u-r-n right okay cool so um yeah the unfortunate circumstances moment for me i would say regarding business was definitely signing like a seven-year lease being excited to open a business with my wife, chasing her journey, ready to support her. This was her idea, her vision. They're all her recipes. She does it all from scratch, right? She's a fantastic baker. Um, and then January, hearing about COVID, right? And then, what? Well, oh, that's weird. I wonder how bad it's going to be. And then within a few weeks, it was like everything shut down. Like the city stopped doing permitting. They started giving out stimulus and unemployment checks. All of our construction crew quit. Um, things just got progressively worse, right? Um, to the point where in March, when we realized we weren't going to open, my wife just started selling cookies on Instagram and people would Venmo her and pick them up from our garage. And so we have customers now who are like, I've been buying since your garage. You know, we're like, dude, A, we wouldn't be here without you, but B, that's crazy that we started in a garage and now we have shops in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and Frisco, Texas and Grenada, Nebraska and places popping up in Florida now, you know, like all over the country. Um, so I think for us, like the unfortunate thing regarding business was, you know, starting during the, during the pandemic, not ideal, you know, but you pivot and you move and you, you, you do what you make it through the way you have to. Right. Um, and then that was in March, June. She's like, Hey, we need to talk. I'm like, yeah, what's up? I'm pregnant. I'm like, dope. <laughs> okay. She's like, what are you thinking? I'm like, listen, we already had three kids at the time. I just lost my business literally that month. We're opening another one. Global pandemic. World's in chaos. You can't even buy toilet paper, right? Things are bad when you can't buy toilet paper, right? Uh, she said, what are you thinking? I'm like, I'm just honestly like trying to think of like how life can get, get that much harder. And she's like, yeah. And then we, a few months later, we finally open our doors. She's five months pregnant this time. Four months pregnant, whatever. So she's sick. Working 80 hours a week, we're both our, um, two months after we get our, our, our store open, our house catches on fire. <sighs> so now she's seven months pregnant, right? And burned down house, brand new business, three kids who we have to homeschool because the schools are shut down. So I'm now a homeschool teacher, new business owner, pregnant wife, and we don't have a house, like legit. So trying to find a house during the pandemic to Airbnb or... It was, Can't even imagine. It was impossible, right? So we ended up staying with my mother-in-law for a number of months. We had, you know, we all shared our room, right? Kids up on the floor. It was it was wild. Um, so that I mean, for me, business-wise, there was a lot of life lessons in those moments. You know, a lot of hardship. I think everybody struggled during the pandemic. Um, I really, obviously, they did, and so many people lost more than we did, right? Um, but you know, like you were saying, like you got choices in those moments, like. Are you going to dig deep and focus on the positive or are you going to let the negative atmosphere, the negative environment, the negative things in your life, are you going to let them beat you, right? Facing your demons, right? Um, I think you kind of have to, you know, pound your chest and say, let's go, you know, be your own hype man and get through those moments because they suck for sure. But I mean, I would honestly, it sounds cliche, but I wouldn't change any of it. I really wouldn't, you know, because I, I learned so much in those moments, you know, like, when we first opened our business, my, my wife, I was like, oh, she's, she was pregnant. So she'd go to the bathroom and she was feeling sick. And one time I couldn't find her and I go in the warehouse. And we'd been open for maybe four months at this time and our house had burnt down. Um, and I go in the warehouse that's attached to our building and she's back there and she's like crying. I'm like, what's up? She's like, this is hard. I'm like, for sure. You know, like, it, we were not doing well financially. We put all of our savings, all of our investment, took out cash advances. The bank we were doing a loan with for our business pulled it because, like, oh, we, after God clause, it wasn't funded, so we're not going to do it, right? And it was just like, 
all right, we're probably, we could go bankrupt and lose everything with small children, right? So, I mean, for us, those were unfortunate moments, dude. But they, but my wife, she runs marathons. She's, she's a badass. She's way better than I am in so <laughs> many things. Um, she's like, let's, we got work to do, let's go, you know? And we just, that's the mindset is like, let's go, you know? So during those tough times, did you have something that brought you guys joy to some degree? For sure. I think, I think for us, you know, seeing the, we, when we first opened our doors and still, but when we first started the, the, the cookie co, we had little victories every day with new customers coming in successes, new records, you know, Hey, this was our best day yet. Hey, this is our best week yet. Like full transparency. When we started, we had a goal like, Hey, if we do this our first month, and just do this monthly, like, we'll be okay. And it was pretty modest, right? It wasn't like, hey, we're trying to be crazy successful during a pandemic. We were pretty realistic with our goals. Um, and I think that helped that we were realistic instead of saying, hey, we want to do this or else, right? Like, we were realistic. Like, what do we need to survive? What do we got to do pay for our kids, our mortgage, et cetera, right? Um, and, like, our first four days open, we hit our monthly goal. We're like, whoa. I'm, like, looking at the numbers, I'm like, did we make a calculation there? Like what? <laughs> no. And like continually, like we just crushed it. Like we, we, we did in our first two months, we did what we wanted to do for the entire year. Wow. Our first year, I like expect it. Right. So, um, it, it, there's a lot of little wins that keep you going and you focus on the little wins and you focus on, okay, what's next. And then you get to a point where like, okay, we're consistent. How do we grow? And that's when franchising came about, you know, we were going to do a spot in Rancho Cucamonga and Newport beach. We're looking at a couple spots we want to do. And then we had people from like Virginia and all over the country that DMing us like, Hey, we heard about you online. We saw you on social media. Like we want to open one in our town. And I'm like, First of all, how do you spell franchise? I knew nothing about it, right? Um, to the point now where it's like, hey, we got a franchise attorney, we got employees, we're hiring, we're doing this, we're doing that, got an FDD in place, like, cool, let's go. Brand new franchise model, right, it, for us. Like, knew nothing about this. So suddenly I went from, like, losing a business, serving cookies at, a, at our shop, right? And I love that job. One of my favorite jobs ever, talking to people while serving their cookies. People come to buy cookies on a good day or a bad day. You meet some great people, um, to running franchises and supporting franchisees around the country, you know, it was a trip. Wow. So yeah, it's been fun though. How hard was it to, to franchise? Cause you're almost just giving away your baby into, into someone else's hands. Yeah. So with franchising, there's a lot that goes into it, but to your point with, you know, you, you want to work with the right people to protect the brand, right? Like brand integrity is important. Customer experience is important, right? Brand affinity, brand awareness, the recipe, the quality, you know, all those things matter because they're all my wife's recipes. We use certain ingredients. Like one of the things about us that makes us different, like you said in the intro, we're better than other companies, right? Um, and I don't mention them a lot because they, I don't know if you know, they like, they like to sue people. They sue people all the time. It's all the cookie wars. Look it up. Look, just Google cookie wars. It's really? Sound, it sounds stupid. But they've sued like a bunch of companies just for selling cookies in a box. And I'm like, you want me to put them in, wrap them in saran wrap? What should I do? Right? Like, yeah. it's weird. <laughs> what? So, so I don't like to talk a lot of crap about them. Yeah. Just because I'm like, mm. and they tried with us when we were in our garage still. Like, they, they tried suing you. They sent us a demand letter. Could you say the company? To wait. Which company? Could you say which company? The C word. It's the C word. Crum really? Crumble, yeah. Oh. Yeah, they sent us a demand letter when we first opened saying, like, we can't use the color black. Well, I, I wear black every day. Uh, <laughs> most restaurants, it's the most common color. We can't use black. We can't use boxes. Delete your social media. There was like 15 requests. We gave them to our attorney. He's like, this is a scare tactic. This is what they try to do. They hope that you guys are stupid enough to basically agree to these terms and ultimately sabotage your own business. And I'm like, well, kindly respond with the following. He's like, yeah. I'm like, F you. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to say that. But I'm like, I've already lost everything. I just started this. I, Dude, I'm not... I'm not going to be, a, I'm not a pushover. Like I, I will keep on swinging until I'm dead. Yeah. Right. And so that like sparked a fire in my wife and I back then, I think when we first got that letter from them. So I think, I thank them in some ways for attributing a, a lot of our success. Cause you guys just pissed us off a little bit and made us like F it. Let's go. It's like that clip. Um, it's from the bear. You ever watch the bear on FX? I don't think so. The guy no. that's sitting there in an interview and he's like, and he's getting choked up and his hair is all crazy. He's like, you know, and that really hurt. And I was like, all right, you watch this right have you seen that clip no i've never seen the show it. To, that clip that's, that's kind of how it was like all right f you watch this and then yeah. we just went 
went ham. We went for it, you know? So the plan was, again, to survive the pandemic. We weren't even considering franchising or growing until they came out with us, came at us with this. And we're like, F it, let's go. So then we were like, let's be a national franchise. And now we're doing stuff in Canada and we have interest in the UAE. Uh -huh. Congrats. And it's wild, man. Did yeah. you ever hear from them after? Um, we went back and forth. Our attorneys did a couple of times. And then it ended up kind of just falling apart. They're like, hey, agree to this. And we're like, okay, that's easy. We agreed to it. It was basically like, don't do this. And we're like, we were not even doing this. But okay, we'll continue to not do that. Cool. That was it. Yeah. And they were amicable. We haven't heard about them. We, we, we just haven't done anything. They haven't done anything. We, you know, we're chill. You know, it's, it's that was almost three years ago now. It was wow. like right when we started. So yeah, probably two and a half years ago. Uh, I got to ask this before we go to the next acronym, but how did your house burn down? Dude, so our house was built in like 1978, right? And we had this old bathroom in the hallway. And it had like, if you've been in like homes built in the, like the 70s, or seen a car from the 70s, or listen to a lot of music in the 70s, I'm convinced that like architects, musicians, car designers were doing a lot of cocaine and drugs because the designs <laughs> just sucked, bro. <laughs> the designs sucked. And so like, you go in our bathroom and like you had this like weird fluorescent light that dropped down above the mirror, right? And it was like a wall. It's like, it's, it's like a soffit, right? So my wife's like, I hate this. Let's just knock that out and then just put regular like recess lighting and paint the bathroom and do a new tile shower um, and, and just a very light makeover because it was an ugly, ugly, and we had done a lot of the house. So they took out the soffit and the contractor is like, I'll, I'll put the lights in tomorrow. And I was actually in Utah with our attorney at the time, setting up our franchise stuff, right? Um, and I said, oh, the bathroom will be done within a few days. Cool. So I'm in the hotel room, and I get a call from my wife at like 4 a.m. She's like, hey, I'm like, what, what's up? She's like, our house is on fire. And I literally jumped out of bed like in the hotel room, like go to like, my kids' rooms just out of like reaction. And I'm like, I'm in a hotel 800 miles away. I'm like packing my, like, where are the kids? She's like, I'm getting the kids out. We're getting out right now. Like, what should I do? I'm like, call 911. I could hear the alarm going off. Like, our dog was barking. I'm like, panicking, right? So I packed my, I let, like, just threw on clothes and like, left half my stuff in the hotel. Got an Uber, went straight to the hotel. It's like a movie. When you go to different uh, airline counters, like, hey, I need a ticket ASAP. Like, well, we only have first class. I'm like, I'll take it. Like, it leaves in four hours. I'm like, next, go to yeah. Southwest, go to, like, whatever freaking. British Airlines. I'm like, do you guys go to Ontario, California? I need a flight. And finally, they're like, hey, this place has a flight leaving in 45 minutes. We're going to call them. I got a flight and I got home. And like the firefighters were still putting out the fire, right? Oh. So my wife, kids, all of them were good. Um, they all got out. Dogs got out. Um, so that was, that was a crazy moment. Also a time of reflection where like, this could have been so much worse, mm -hmm. right? So the house actually started because the contractor... Um, knocked down the soffit and instead of doing the lights, he put the wiring back up there to get to tomorrow and it caused insulation to kind of um, spark. Yeah. And it just kind of started smoldering at night and she woke up to go to the bathroom because she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She goes to the bathroom like six times a night when she's pregnant. And um, she's like, smell smoke. And the house flames and the whole hallway next to our kids' rooms and it was wild, dude. It's like a... <sighs> nightmare movie scene <laughs> it, was, it was probably to this day probably the probably the second scariest day of my life for sure where were you at i was in utah i had meetings with our uh we had a franchise attorney out there at the time that we were using um and i was out there meeting with them and so i had meetings there and then i had meeting the next morning i was flying home mm. and so she called me i was in the hotel and it was feeling helpless with my wife and children like literally in active danger like that, like to me, like it still bothers me. Like I should have been there, but there's no way you could have known that. Yeah. Like, I feel like I, not like I failed in that moment, but like that was an opportunity or a moment where I should have protected or been there and I wasn't. So that bothers me. That eats me up a little bit as a husband, father, protector kind of a feel, you know? But, uh, but yeah, that was, that was scary, dude. Mm -hmm. You said that was the second scariest time. What was the first? Um, probably when my wife was pregnant with our second kid. Being a father is a lot of scary moments. You guys will learn that someday, bro. Like, <laughs> first, the first time your wife says, hey, I'm pregnant, that's terrifying. Because you're like, what? what? <laughs> right? But then, like, our second kid, um, just a scary moment with uh, his pregnancy, uh, her pregnancy. You know, she mm -hmm. went for an ultrasound. She's about seven months pregnant. And the doctor's like, hey, you lost the baby. She's like, oh, what do you mean? Like, I haven't felt a move today. So then she started getting panic and 
so they send us to a specialist because at that point the baby's too big to just have a miscarriage. So they do an operation to remove the baby. Um, and we go to do an ultrasound like eight hours later at the specialist. And he's like, I, let me go get an, another doctor. We're like, is everything okay? He's like, let me get another doctor. And so like, we don't know how to tell you this, but that doctor shouldn't have told you that. Your baby's fine. We're like, what? Like for like 12 hours straight, we were just bawling. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just sick feeling. And the baby was fine, you know? Like just the doctor got a bad angle on the ultrasound. There was no heartbeat. And he's like, I don't feel it move. Uh, you've lost this child. We'll have to go see a specialist. He was a very cold, terrible bedside manner. <laughs> I wish I knew that dude's name. Yeah. I hate that guy. <laughs> um, so that was scary, bro, as a yeah. father. That was, that was, that was a terrifying yeah, I can day. I imagine that. It was terrifying, you know? And, and, but again, as soon as he basically said, hey, I don't know how to say this, the doctor effed up. Like, it went from being one of the worst days of my life to one of the best. Like, love having kids, love being a father, but it was like, it made that pregnancy and that child that much more special, right? Because yeah. you're like, man, I thought we lost this dude. And he's, he's, he's good. Like, are you sure? Like, yeah, he's good. Like, you're positive. He's like, yes. I, listen, heartbeat going, you're like, Okay, you know, and so it, it, that that was probably one of the worst days of my life, probably the scariest day of my life as a, as an adult. You know, I'm sure I had scary moments of the dark when I was a kid or whatever. Yeah, but, but as an adult, like real life moments, like that was that was scary. Wow, so, you've been through a lot of unfortunate, very moments, man. Right, I just looked at a photo yesterday that my wife posted outside of our cookie store, and I was like, "When did my hair get so gray?" Oh, I saw you post that on <laughs> bro, Instagram. I shared the story. I was like, "When did my yeah. hair get this gray, bro?" I'm like. And my wife's like, your hair is so gray. I'm like, this is, I wear a hat a lot just out of habit. I've always worn a backwards hat since mm -hmm. I was a kid. Skating, BMXing, I, mean, I just always wore a hat. And so like some days I don't, I'll do my hair some days. And I did, and I'm like, I got to wear a hat more. My hat, it, my hair is so gray, bro. <laughs> and it's from businesses and stress and moments like that. And, yeah. You know? So, yeah, dude. You should I, throw some color in there. Bro, I, I bleached it last year because a friend's like, you should bleach your hair. I'm like, I, I will. He's like, you won't do it. I'm like, I don't care. So I bleached it. And my wife's like, I actually think it looks good. I'm like, maybe I should do that again now that it's gray. But I'm like, I'll go with that salt and pepper George Clooney look a little bit. Maybe. Salt and pepper. <laughs> that <laughs> silver fox look. Do you think you'll do it? You'll go back to one or no? I mean, maybe. I'm pretty spontaneous, dude. I don't care. It never was, said, yeah, never it's just hair. It grows back. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll bleach mine if you bleach yours. So we'll oh. do it together. <sighs> That's tough. Dude, I don't got, know if my mom would let me. Dude, you got beautiful golden locks, bro. You got long <laughs> hair. It look good. Uh, should we? Maybe. Should we? No, this is you. Maybe. No, no. me and Matt. Me and Your Matt. mom's oh. a hairstylist. My so mom's maybe. a hairstylist. I, oh, I would I'll, only do it if it was if she did it. I'll do She'll it. do both of ours. Tell, text her after this and tell her to do it. I'll do it right now. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't even care. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I could do it. It'd be tough. It'd be hard. I, I love my hair. I don't know. You've got good hair. I've got a receding be, hairline. I'm, I'm gray. I've got nothing to lose. You've got a lot to lose. I, 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 got a, I got a big forehead, so that's why I'm always wearing that. <laughs> they call that a five head. A five head. Mine's like ten head. If that's even a thing. <laughs> this portion of the Burn Factory podcast is sponsored by Phoenix Salon Suites. Please visit Phoenix Salon Suites at P-H-E-N-I-X Salons, S-A-L-O-N, Suites, S-U-I-T-E-S dot -E com to find one near you. All right, Matt, it's time to go to R and yeah. Burn Ridiculous. You, uh, unfortunately, Burn moves always make to who we are. And yeah. I think all those times in your life have really built you to have a successful business that you have today. But R, R stands for ridiculous. So is there any ridiculous moments that you could share with us? Bro, this should be called the burn factory because I feel like <laughs> I've got so many R moments in my life, dude. <laughs> my life is ridiculous, like straight up. Like my wife and I joke around like all the time. She's like, I feel like we should have a reality show just because she's like, there's so many crazy moments in our lives that they almost feel staged and made up. Like most reality shows are like, oh, this is reality. It's not. not. Like my moments actually are just real life, bro. But uh, I would say, yeah, here's one. So there's this dude named, I don't know if I should say his name. I just remember his name, so I want to say it. But say, it. Say, say his name. His name is Wayne. Wayne, okay. okay. And he's a valet driver or valet, <laughs> valet guy. And I was in Las Vegas for fights last summer with my wife and kids and they were hanging out with friends out in Summerlin and I was going to the fights and the morning we were going to go meet up with friends for breakfast. So we go downstairs um, and we go to get our ticket, uh, our, our, our valet ticket. And I'm like, I lost the valet ticket. 
So I go to the valet driver and say, hey, I don't have my valet ticket. I lost it. I'm staying here. This is my room card. He said, oh, you just go to the front desk. Tell them you lost your card. They'll match it to your room. They'll get you a new one. I'm like, not a big deal. Wife's got a baby. I'm a stroller with three other kids. I'm like, I'll be right back. Go in. Oh, yeah, you got to go to the valet closet. I'm like, where's that? It's downstairs. Follow us. So I follow them. I'm on this freaking journey, right? Go there. It's closed. I'm like, what do we do? <laughs> like, well, let me find somebody. We walk outside, talk to the same valet guy. No, you got to go to the front desk. I'm like, no, this guy's from the front desk. Like, well, have him go to the valet closet. We went to the valet closet. They're closed. He's like, they shouldn't be closed. I mean, I'm working. He's like, let me see. So he goes in. Hey, follow me. Follows me. We're going through random places. At this point, it's like 15 minutes. My wife's like, hey, we got to go. Like, where are you at? I'm like, I, babe, I'm not, on a, I'm not at the blackjack table. Like, I'm trying to get our freaking car. <laughs> so finally, like 20 minutes goes by. A guy shows up. Yeah, sorry. I was taking a quick break, smoke break. Um, yeah, here I am. Like, give me your key, your ID. I'm like, all right, cool. Here's my room key. Here's my ID. Like, I'll get your keys. I'll get your car right out. Takes them like 10 minutes. So at this point, it's like a half hour. Uh, I'm on the lower floor. She's on the upper floor of the hotel, the up valet. She calls me again. I'm, like, I'm waiting. And this, I'm on the phone with my wife, and this guy's got my keys. And he like, unlocks the car. He's walking over. I go, oh, hey. I was like, uh, those are my keys. Like, and you are? I'm like, you've got my ID in your hand, and you're holding my keys, and you just turn it on. Like, that, that, that's, what's your name? I'm like, Matt Thomas. I'm like, okay. How do I know <laughs> this is you? I'm like, you have my ID in your hand. And that's my Kia, that's my car. Like, and he's like, he walks away. I'm like, hey, hold on, I gotta go. Hey, that's my, can we? Can I get going? I've got places to be, bro. Like I've been here for 35 minutes. He's like, I, I, I can't validate this. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, bro, give me my fucking car. And this he, is the same guy you gave the ID at the beginning. No, this with. is another guy. Oh, it's another guy. Okay. Yeah. And so this guy is like. I can't validate this. I'm like, look at my name, look at my face, look, open the glove box, you'll see that that car matches the address on the ID. It's a new car, registration's in there. Like, So I'm like, hey, just give me my car, let me go, right? He's like, security, I need someone else. Like, you're calling security? Is it, you're out of control. And he walks off. I'm like, bro, I've been here for 40 minutes. So security comes, like, what's going on? I was like, dude, this dude's got my keys, he's got my ID, he's got my room key in his hand. He hit the alarm button. I said, oh, cool, babe, I gotta go. He's got my keys. Think we're making progress finally after 45 minutes. And the guy's like, I don't know who this guy is. I'm like, is this guy, like, did you guys find this guy at the DMV, the most incompetent <laughs> employment in the world? Like, you've got my ID in your hand. Here's a bank card that says my name also matches my ID. Like, that's my key. Like, open the glove box. I'll show you the registration. He said, all right, I'll open the glove box. You got to show me the registration. I'm like, okay. This is, we're going almost an hour, bro. Almost an hour. So the security's there. They're on their little bikes, yellow shirts. The yellow shirts. And, and and they open the door, open the glove box, and I'm going through. I'm like, I new license plates on the car, like the paper plates that California makes you do. So I open. I was like, I, I don't have the registration. I just got the car. But here's the, the car information from the dealer. My name, address, matching the driver's license, everything. I bought it three weeks earlier. I can't accept that's not a registration. I'm like, so at that point, I, I like grabbed the keys out of his hand. I'm like, give my fucking keys, dude. <laughs> and the security like grabs me. I'm like, whoa, you, you can't touch him like that. I said, like, bro, my wife and kids, we got places to be. I've been here for an hour. So that guy goes and calls like security, another security, and they bring the cops and the cops come and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, dude, listen, I've been here for over an hour inside this car, showing my ID. He's got my driver's key. He's got it. He's got all my information. He's saying he can't validate this is my car. He's like, do you have anything that shows? I was like, that's my license. I didn't, I mean, I'm not trying to steal a car that has a bunch of potato chip crumbs and road trip food snacks from my <laughs> kids and a car seat with gummy bears stuck to it. Like it says, wouldn't be the car of choice, the freaking hotel. I'd steal that Bentley if I was going to steal a car, right? And so the finally cops, it sounds like you're getting the runaround. I'm like, I, I, I agree. It's like, give the guy his keys. I'm like, okay, keys done. I go up, you can pick my wife and kids. And this dude, Wayne, is like walking by. I go, I got my keys. Oh, we talked to the manager. They comped me in my room for the headache you guys me. Thanks for the free room. He's like, you're 86, pal. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> and so where do you stay now when you go to Vegas since you haven't been Resorts there? World. Oh, Resorts Have World. Have you stayed there? Okay. We stayed there once, like Dude. right when it opened. Yeah. So I started staying there um, about a year ago. Place is legit. I'm a yeah? fan. Yeah. They've got, they've got good food, good restaurants. They've always got good shows. Um, and then, the pool. Yeah. It's a good spot. I've stayed there a few times. So. It's, it's weird. Resorts World is like two different hotels. It's three. I, yeah, you got the Hilton, the Crockford, and the Conrad. So like the Hilton's like a base level one. Then you got the Crockford and the Conrad is like the higher end one. Um, Henry and I stayed there for the last fight we were at when we were there in, I think. Is it July? In July, yeah. Yeah. 
So he stayed there, and my homie Jalen, a lot of the UFC fighters stay there now because Resort World takes care of them and hooks them up. So it's it's kind of becoming a new a new place. Like they've got like a Carver Steakhouse in there. They've got an oh, eight nice. lounge, a cigar lounge. They've got some really cool restaurants and bars in there. Um, really cool environment, cool vibe. Yeah. So we'll have to give it another try because we stayed like right when they opened. So most of the restaurants weren't even open for sure, and it was very dead in there. But I think now, dude, next be time cool. we go, I'll head up my homie. He's a uh, he oversees the the Carver Steakhouse. It's one of the top steakhouses in Vegas now. He says, really. Um, I've I like it, you know. It's good. It's, it's just small. basic steakhouse. It's a higher end steakhouse, okay, for sure. Um, I mean, they've got like normal stuff, but like a good steak, really anywhere you go is like hundred bucks, hundred fifty bucks. They've got some stuff that's a one wagyu. It's like ridiculous yeah. pricing that I'm like, I'm not. Ah. take a bite of food for two hundred dollars. Like I'm good. <laughs> when I go to restaurants, I'm a sucker for sweet potato fries. Ooh, sweet, sweet potato, potato fries. Are good. Some restaurants serve them with honey. That's honey and cinnamon. Yeah, uh, that's that's where it is. Yes. I try to be healthy like that. I'm I overall I'm like a pretty healthy eater. Like for sure, six days a week I'm for eating sure. pretty healthy. You I'm not on the Five Guys hamburgers. Yet. Eighty twenty rule is what I live by. Like eighty percent healthy, twenty percent uh, maybe not, maybe it shouldn't, but I'm going to. Yeah, and I own a cookie store, bro. So <laughs> and you brought us some. Thank I God. Yeah, some. thank you God for bringing for sure. us. Yeah, thank it. you, and but Nothing. thank thank God I worked out this morning because I'm gonna have Balance. to indulge in some of those. Balance, bro. <laughs> Balance those. But all right, Matt, it's time to go to in and burn. It's kind of two parts. So the first part is now. So what are some things that you're doing now? What are some burn moments you're facing right now? And then next, what are some burn moments that you see coming in the future? Yeah, so now I'd say the burn moments right now are really just, you know, like I said, hiring a new CEO, a lot of transitions, and, and I think a lot of humbling experiences for me. Uh, I think I checked my ego a long time ago, a few years back and, and whatnot. So I've got a new CEO, and so she's coming in, and she's I hired her because she's fantastic, and she's way better than I am at, at franchise, and she's done it for 22 years and sold her last company for over $2 billion, right? She knows what she's doing. So it is a humbling moment for me where she comes in and says, hey, here's the things you've done wrong. Here's the things we got to fix. Here's the change we got to make immediately. And it's kind of like, all right, I messed up a bunch. It's like kind of a kick in the gut, but you know it's the right move. So that's yeah. kind of a burn moment, like a humbling moment, you know. Um, burn moments for the future. Um, I mean, like we talked about earlier, like you can learn from all these. So I'm not, I'm not hoping for more burn moments, but taking them as they come and seeing what I can learn from them. Some that are upcoming are just the consistent growth. You know, we've got stuff happening in Canada right now. Um, we've got other places around the country that are popping up and there's always new challenges. You know, there's always new opportunities, new things to learn. You know, I mean, the more we grow, you know, the more issues we face or more threats we face from competition, things like that. And so just being prepared um, as we grow and handling the situations, um, just a lot of those burn moments, mm -hmm. you know. Employee turnover is never fun. We've lost a couple of employees in the last, you know, handful of months due to some changes. Like, Certain jobs, hey, we actually don't need this role anymore. We got a new deal with this vendor who they're doing this for us. This role doesn't exist anymore. We appreciate you. Let's have you do this role now. And they're like, hey, I'm frustrated. I don't, I don't feel appreciated, right? Which I try to be a friendly person. I try to treat my employees well. And so it's disheartening when you hear those kinds of things. And they're like, I'm going to go find another job. You're like, dude, let's work together. Let's figure out what we can do, you know? Those are burn moments, I think. You yeah. know? Opportunities to learn how to be better in the future, for sure. Mm -hmm. Where do you see a uh, cookie co in like five years? So our, we've got goals for that, right? So like within five years, we want to have 500 locations. So five years from today, we want to have 500 operating locations. And what do you have right now? Yeah. 25. 25. 25. That's what so we got our work cut out for us. But the cool thing is we've got, we've got a lot in the pipeline. So the way it works, long story short, is you have stores that are open in the next 30 days, 60, 90, 120, and then you have you know, your list of prospects who you're talking to and communicating with. And there's four or 500 just in that prospect list alone today that we're talking to, vetting, qualifying, seeing if they're interested, if the market's available. So we have a lot of interest, which is good. We've got a great product, which I think people, like my favorite thing ever is when we open the community, like, hey, we haven't gone to this other place since you guys opened. Like, cool. So like the, the demand is there, right? Mm -hmm. So we just got to keep on open locations with the right people and, and up our marketing, up our branding, awareness, stuff like that. So I think we'll get there. That's, that's a goal. 500 in five, five years. If, you can cool. do it if you put your mind to it. Put your mind to it. You can do anything, bro. Yeah. Straight up. For sure. I, I what, really like what you guys do, though, is you were telling us that you actually import each ingredient to the store. 
like by itself, right? Yeah. And then they make it fresh every single day in the back. Yeah, they start at 6 a.m. every day, baking fresh. Um, all of our food is delivered one or two days a week, depending on where your location is at and how much you need. Um, but we, we use real eggs, real butter, real sugar. We don't use preservatives like high fructose corn syrup or oil or manufactured eggs. Like real gourmet cookies. Like if your mom were to make cookies for you today, what would she use, right? Like real ingredients. So that's important to my wife and us. Um, and then the, the, the cool thing is that, you know, we, all of our food is, it comes in a certain way that we could have you being a professional baker by next week if you had a store. Like straight up, like it's very, it's foolproof, you know? Wow. And we've, it's, it's easy, you know? Not easy, but it's, it's teachable. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What made you get into the cookie business? My wife's always been an awesome baker. She's always been crushing it with baking. She did cupcakes for a long time and then she started doing cookies and then we had people from like our neighborhood and like businesses like, hey, like I heard you have great cookies. Like, would you mind catering my event? And she's like, yeah, how many people? And she's like, 1,200. She's like, Oof, I've got like an easy bake oven at my house that I'm using. Like, I don't even have like a commercial kitchen. So she did it and people are like, hey, we want to hire you. And they're like, why don't you open your own shop? And she's like, I should. And this was like 2016, 2017. Um, so, and then she planned for a couple of years and the time is right in 2019 and we opened in 2020. So, mm. yeah. one thing I like is whenever you guys did get started, you guys would start off in the little, I don't know where exactly you were, but you guys would actually hand box the cookies and pass them out. Yeah. And what, what, what made you, why, why is your wife called the cookie lady? So in our town, we live in Redlands, California. My wife's born and raised there, basically. Um, and so we've lived there since like 2009. We left for a couple of years for a contract for work I used to have, but we came back. Um, and so when we first started selling cookies, when she came up with the idea, we were just getting like pie boxes. And we bought like a custom stamp that said Cookie Co. on it. And we would stamp the boxes ourselves, let them dry, and we put our cookies on them. And we'd go and drop them off at like hospitals, schools, fire stations, police stations, just like places in our community, like first responders, especially during the pandemic, right? Showing appreciation, all that. And then people just started calling her like, oh, the cookie lady, you know, her name's Elise. Mm -hmm. But you're like, oh, the cookie lady's here, right? And that kind of became like her like name like, in our community and like just overall. So like her Instagram is like Elise the cookie lady um, because that's the way they call her. So like she has a recipe book coming out in May. Um, we just got that, we just got the contract all done and she's oh, got, nice. it'll be in Target and all these other places and stuff in a few months. Um, but in there, she's got a couple of cookie recipes that we don't do at the store that they're like, Hey, put a cookie recipe in. And she's like, I don't want to give away them my recipes. Yeah, yeah, no, she has a couple that we've stuff. never done. So they're in there and stuff. But I mean, she just, she loves cookies. She runs marathons. Um, before I left this morning, I waited till she got home cause she ran 21 miles today cause oh. she has a marathon September 9th. So she's. She she jokes jokes that she started running so that she could eat cookies whenever she wanted, but but yeah. So the cookbook is all other dishes. Yeah, so cookies. yeah, so it's breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, and then oh, gatherings. Nice. So oh. she'll do like gatherings, like cool uh, finger foods and things that she does for like New Year's Eve parties and family friends who come over and like barbecues and side dishes and stuff. And then her favorite brunches, like she has this thing called French toast casserole. Sounds unbelievable. Bro, it's stupid good. It's so good. Like I, could, I would rather have that for my birthday than cake, straight up. Really? So I should have brought you guys. I should have made you guys some. Oh, uh, next time, next yeah. time. Maybe we'll so, just get the copy and try it out ourselves, dude, and then we'll give it to her and you guys and see how how good out, we did. Come out, check out our location in Redlands for a day and hang out, and we'll do like dinner. I'll just have her make a few things. Like Jalen uh -huh. Turner, you know Jalen. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Jalen came over. I called him one day when he was he wasn't he wasn't even in camp yet, and I'm like, Yo, what are you doing? He's like, I just got done training. I'm like. You want to come over? He's like, yeah, what's up? I'm like, Elisa's doing photos for her cookie book today, so she's just got tons of food over, uh, just being photos and stuff. And he came over, and he probably gained like nine pounds that day. He just ate everything. He's like, Bro, <laughs> this is, what is this called? He's like, this is the best thing I've ever had. So like, she like, will like, make food and like, tell Jalen to come over and taste it. So like, we had a video on Instagram the other day that like, got a ton of traffic. We're like me and Jalen were going through and like canceling our lowest performing cookies. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. So we're like canceled, canceled. And Jalen's like, "What? That's one of my favorite." <laughs> Not that, bro. The data says it's a low performing cookie. He's like, "Give it one more shot, right?" So, uh, so, so yeah. So that's that's how she became a cookie lady, and now she's kind of, you know, became this like little. You know, we've had some people reach out to us. Uh, I, I think it was either Netflix or Prime, one of them, about doing like a show. Oh, and we were entertaining that for a little bit, and they had us. They want us to do like a little trailer kind of a thing. Mostly what is the show, it just like a not even a reality show, like it's a like behind the scenes, behind the scenes kind of a show, like starting your business during the pandemic to where you are now and the growing pains of being a successful female entrepreneur, right? 
And so we've talked about doing that. And she's like, I don't know if I want like my kids on camera. I don't know if I want people to see this like part of my life because my life is crazy. I'm like, but that's what people like. People like chaos, right? And they want the real stuff too. The real stuff, authentic you know? stuff. And that's how she became. And that's why she started her Instagram. Like before we even opened our door, she had like 30, 35,000 followers on Instagram because wow. she's like, hey, like. I'm a mom of four. My life's a mess. This is just raw, authentic material. And moms are like, thank you for being like a real person and not trying to say that you, that you look beautiful when you wake up and that your kids are perfectly behaved and your house is never messed, right? She's like, my life is crazy. So just real and authentic. I think people like that, you know? Yeah. So, you guys got a lot of stuff brewing. I'm, I'm happy for you guys. Trying yeah. to, man. Taking yeah. opportunities as they come. Thank yeah. you guys. I love what you guys are doing. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Matt. Appreciate thank it. you. Uda. You just spelled burning your life. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for Tell having me. Tell the audience where they can find you on Instagram, your website, your cookies, everything. Yeah. Website, Instagram is just cookie co. Um, so just cookie co Instagram handle. Uh, website, cookieco.com. We got an app launch coming in about two weeks, beginning of September. So be able to, all mm. locations uh, will be shipping and all those locations you do curbside pickup, all that. So um, a lot of good things coming. So, awesome. you heard the man. Go, go, give some love to Cookie Co. And Matt, as a gift for coming on the podcast, you will be getting the Black Label Edition Burn Factory hoodie, where only guests get these, so no other strangers. So wear it loud. Wear it Here proud, you go, sir. I will, 100. percent I brought you guys some gifts too. I brought you guys Ooh. some cookies. Ooh. So these were made this morning before oh. I left. First out of the oven this Fresh. morning. So. Yeah, oh, chocolate oh, chip. Nice. Whole good thing. Good thing so. I worked out. I need to indulge in some of those. Let's see. Check Let's it out these on the camera. So this is the six pack, right? So we got six flavors each week. We'll open it. Um, chocolate chip oh, well, is don't. a staple. Frosted sugar. The one on the top right. That's monster. Oh, my oh gosh. This, is the, this is what I had in the car. The which one? The orange. Yeah, the frosted sugar. Uh -huh. Let's yeah. give it a little show. Yeah, yeah. They smell unbelievable. Caramel apple crumb. That one's bomb. It's kind of oh. like a muffin. So I love that one to the bottom right. Oh, but man. Is this like strawberry it? sauce? Uh, yeah, it's strawberries. Yeah. I actually think that one's raspberry. 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 Yeah. What is this one? Caramel apple crumb. Caramel apple crumb. So it's kind of like the muffin top, like the crumb muffins, right? Oh. It's, it's, it's kind right. of like the top end of that. We'll give it a taste pull, test. Pull a little. One bite. Everybody knows the rules. One bite. Everyone knows the rules. Oh, this is a fire and ice episode, but only ice. Wow. Dude, they're so. Oh my the, god! That's the thing is that we. That's unbelievable. Thank you. It I, melts in your mouth. Oh, and this one was a caramel apple. Yeah. Mm. Number one. That one's number one. What was that like sugar? Mm-hmm. We'll give the sugar one a little. He taste. tried that one in the car when we were in Vegas. Yeah, I remember and that. He rated that one number one then too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> number one. That's his go-to. He loves the 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 frosted with the sprinkles. The chocolate chip is an OG. Mm. Unbelievable. All right, put these away. I can't be eating them. Give them to me. I'm trying to keep my summer body on. <laughs> Summer's over, bro. Summer's over. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. And always, please visit my foundation at thepriestjamesfoundation.org. Again, thepriestjamesfoundation.org to understand why this is called The Burn Factory. Like always, like, comment, and subscribe at The Burn Factory Podcast. And we'll see you guys for the next episode. Peace. All right, guys, we're here with Matt Thomas, who just spelled burn in his life. And he is now the Burn Factory Podcast champion. Thank you. Thank you. And still <laughs> the best cookies ever. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. But, uh, thank, thank you, Matt. You thank you so on. much for coming on. Thank you for sharing your, your story. I know you were an inspiration to a lot of people out there. To Dude, keep this going. guy, you guys. You guys so, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. It. You have fun? You yeah, enjoy it? It was great. Awesome. 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 It was fun. Thank you.